and welcome. I'm really excited about today's show because it's filled with some of our favorite barbecue and picnic recipes. Some of these segments go back years and years, and I know that you all need these recipes because um, I use them all the time, and if I use them, you need them. Well, I hope you've been doing lots of grilling and eating outdoors. The weather's been fantastic. Joey? What's Hi. your favorite thing to barbecue? A big, juicy cheeseburger. Oh. You, the whole, I just the love whole cheeseburger. juicy cheeseburger is put on the grill all yes. together? Yes. Including the, the bun I, and I the... I put teriyaki sauce in there sometimes. And I cover That's the burger, cheese. though. Yeah, just the burger. It's my favorite thing to grill. Although... In a covered um, grill or an open grill? Um, I cover it so the heat, you know, the, the heat builds up, you know. So and it melts the even, cheese really well? Melts the cheese really well. I'm a cheeseburger nut. Now, what kind of meat do you use? I use just beef, as lean as possible. Chuck, you know, round, uh, sirloin. I invite Chuck every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, just Chuck, you know, or every once in a while, I'll say, you know, grind me up a good piece of meat, you know, and, and uh, I like to make my own. The, the flat ones, they, they get boxed and frozen sometimes. No, 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 no. No, 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 no never, never, never. No, no, no. But uh, a nice big cheeseburger is what I like to have. Good. You know. So, like, pounders or... Half pounder? A quarter pound, a half pound, because it cooks <laughs> down, you know. And the thing is to cook it on a very low flame. Now, do you push your burger with a spatula? No, because you lose your juice that okay, way. You got to let it cook slow. Keep it plump. Don't smash it down. Good. You don't want the flare-ups. A mistake I made was high flame, pushing it down one time. The juice came down. The grease came down. Flare up. Fire in the backyard. My gate was locked. How Couldn't are your eyebrows? The key. My eyebrows, I had to grow them back. <laughs> and then the fire department came, and they I couldn't unlock my gate. They had to step on a, a big flower pot, shoot the hose over the fence. They put it out with a bolt cutter. They cut the lock. They came in. Everything was fine. But don't get it low flame. See, very little the grease. perils of bar backyard barbecuing. Oh. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay, take it from Joey, be careful. <laughs> and don't press down on those hamburgers. That's right. Yes. Well, today you're gonna learn lots of barbecuing tips and techniques, and plus you're gonna end up with some really great recipes, and they'll all be on the website at MarthaStewart.com. But first, let's take some questions from the audience. These audience questions are my favorite part of the program, and raise your hand if you have a question. Hi. Hi, I'm Claudia Lieberman, and Hi. I'm from Oceanside, New York. Um, my husband and I are always fighting while we're barbecuing whether to have the top up or the top down. So he'll put it down, I'll put it up. He'll put it down, I'll put it up. So what are you cooking? Everything, anything, chicken, vegetables, fish. Well, um, I think there's no rule of thumb, but I think that if it's a large piece of meat or a, meat, a piece of meat that takes a long time to cook, like chicken, you know, chicken takes a while to cook, and you want it succulent on the inside and juicy, but you want it beautifully grilled on the outside right. without burning. So I would start it off by browning it a little bit over the grill, then close the top of the grill. That eliminates some of the oxygen and lowers the, uh, the flame without lowering the heat too much so that you're getting that good, intense heat without a big burst of flame, which uh, Joey was just talking about. You don't <laughs> want that flame, because right. that chars, and we don't want charred chicken. A big piece of steak, too, a thick steak. Oh, I had a great London broil the other night uh, my friends made, but it was a big, thick one, and uh, he had it covered. Um, cheeseburger stew, essential to cover if you want to melt that cheese perfectly on top of the burger. So um, it's, um, it's either or, but be careful. And how so, do I keep him, like, Stay at the barbecue. Guess what? Is he doing all the cooking at the grill? Well, he thinks so. Okay, let I him do end it. up taking over. He walks if, away, if and then I take over. It, it's probably good. You know, you can, it's <laughs> okay. probably good. Okay. So, um, I, and if I had somebody to grill for me every single night, <laughs> boy, I wouldn't tell him anything. I learned. I made a pact. When I got divorced, I made a pact. I will not give any man any instructions ever. Just let him cook. <laughs> I take that, no, I just want to temper that. Um, uh, I just want to explain that. If they're working for me, they have to take instructions. <laughs> but if they're just hanging around with me, I will not give them any instructions. <laughs> Good morning, Martha. My name is Christine Valabrona. I'm from Pearl River, New York. Uh, my question's not oh, about welcome. barbecuing. The controller of all of New York? Pearl River. Oh, of Pearl River. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I thought you said a controller of New York. No. Oh, my gosh. Uh, my question's not about barbecuing, it's more personal. I was wondering if you could invite anyone uh, alive or dead to your home as a weekend guest, who would it be and why? Oh, I, I want to think about this. This is a big question. Oh my gosh. Well, um, like for a, just a regular weekend guest, somebody that, I, that wouldn't 
intimidate me or be problematic. I mean, a lot of a lot of very, very, very important people that I would love to meet would be difficult to have around uh, <laughs> for a weekend. Uh, and they might, you know, they might not, not like where they are, and they'd be complaining and stuff. I don't want to do that on a weekend. Let me see. Who would I like to have? Um, oh well, I'd like somebody funny. Okay, let's start off with funny. Uh, last. Um, just not long ago, I met Will Smith. I'd like to have him around for a weekend because he'd be very funny. And uh, Robin Williams would be funny. I don't know if I could take him for a whole weekend, but he would be very funny and keep things lively, I am sure. Um, and if I were in Maine, at my house in Maine, where there's lots of things to do, that physical exercise to do, I'd love to take a real great athlete uh, with me for the weekend and force me to do stuff, you know. Thank you. Know. Thanks for your question. Next, burgers on the grill, and we filled them with a scrumptious surprise. Can you guess? Find out when we come back. Later, spice up any barbecue with a side of simple and delicious homemade corn relish. Stay tuned. isn't just a beef patty anymore. This American classic is constantly being reinvented. Here's our version. There are beef burgers, buffalo burgers, lamb burgers, veggie burgers. Even fancy restaurants have gotten in on the burger craze with ones that can cost up to $50. I just had one at DB44 and it's filled with foie gras, if you can believe it. Today, we're making turkey burgers. And what makes ours really special is that some of the toppings are incorporated right into the turkey meat for added flavor. So let me show you how easy it is. First of all, you get yourself some really nice, fresh ground turkey, one and a half pounds. And pretty much every good supermarket butcher is grinding turkey breast now. It's preferably somewhere between 90 to 93% lean meat, which is healthy and good and a nice alternative to beef. And to this, we're gonna add a half a cup of finely grated Gruyere cheese. That's an odd addition, don't you think? See how finely grated it is? And this just gets incorporated into the turkey. Also, four thinly sliced scallions cut crosswise, the green and white parts, colorful a quarter of a cup of dried breadcrumbs. That helps with the texture of the turkey. A quarter of a cup of Dijon mustard. And don't use hot dog mustard. You know what I'm talking about, that bright, tiny, yellowy mustard that you get on the hot dogs at Yankee Stadium and at the carnivals. So get this mixed in. And also, we're gonna add one clove of garlic, finely minced. That's it. And of course, we're gonna add a little bit of salt and freshly ground black pepper. I'm using a fork to kind of mash it all together. We have some turkey burgers already formed and grilling on the grill. The rolls are toasting gently. And this is for four burgers, by the way, four large, one inch thick burgers. Now I'll just add a little bit of salt and some freshly ground black pepper. Turkey can take some seasoning. So don't mash too much, but you just divide it in half that way and then in quarters, so that way. So now a very nice way to make the burgers themselves, get yourself a bowl of iced water. Just wet your hands like that in ice water. Grab your quarter of the meat and form this into the perfect burger. I like a nice even shaped burger like that. And it works really well with the ice water. It's just amazing how it prevents the meat from sticking to your fingers. And that little bit of extra water isn't bad for the hamburger itself, actually. So you can see a little bit of the green. It's a nice, colorful burger. And you don't want to make this so solid, but you don't want it to fall apart on the grill, either. Whenever you're making meatballs or hamburgers, anything with ground meat, always wet your fingers. You learn that from watching Chinese chefs making those wonderful lion's head meatballs. There. Four gorgeous burgers, almost all the same size. And when I'm grilling, I always have a damp bar mop. This is called a bar mop or a bar cloth, right? Like that, and a dry one. It's very handy to have. Now, on the grill, oh, these are done. Oh, they look so great. Let me take these off. You're going to 
cook the hamburgers on a grill that's been lightly sprayed with nonstick vegetable spray. It's kind of important because turkey burgers don't have a lot of fat in them. So you don't want to just put them right on the grill and expect them not to stick. Don't they look succulent and good? Oh, here's the perfect one. Yummy. So just scrape a little bit where you've already grilled and spray with ham or whatever. Let it cook off a little tiny bit. Add your burgers. And don't move them for a little while. And don't stand there pressing them down. You don't want to compact them. Now put these on the hottest part of the grill and let them start to cook. The rolls are ready. People can dress their own burgers. We have a lot of kids waiting hungrily for their special turkey burger treat. There you have it, delicious. Wow, the kids are having the greatest time. The barbecue is ready. The burgers are delicious. Hey kids, you wanna come and have some food? Who's ready for a turkey burger? I am. <laughs> Help yourself to lettuce, tomato, onion, homemade bread and butter pickles. Make sure there's plenty of squeeze bottles full of their favorite ketchup, their favorite mayo, and their favorite mustard. I like ketchup. Great, these are actually quite delicious for you. So help yourself to salad, whatever you can get, and if you need help, I'll help you. You are Francisco's daughter? Yeah. You're so pretty in your red shirt. What would you like, a turkey burger? Uh, yes, please. Okay, and you can help yourself to sweet potato salad, lettuce and tomato. And we're going from biggest boy to littlest boy. There you are. Enjoy. Okay, here, I'll put some on for you. Is that enough? Yeah. Would you like some? Okay, what about some tomato, lettuce, onion, anything else? No. no? Okay. Oh, you're being adventuresome. Great. <laughs> Having all three. Well, now that they're taken care of, I'll help myself. Some iceberg lettuce, a slice of tomato, homemade bread and butter pickles, a little mayo, and a little ketchup. And remember, the cheese is already melted. The onions already in the burger. Now doesn't that look good? And it's healthy. Burgers in the backyard, the quintessential summertime treat. Hey, you're so quiet. Delish? Yes. Yeah. Good. Very good. Having everyone choose from a selection of condiments and sides makes for a very festive, fun time. We'll be right back. Next, a tasty compliment to any barbecue. Homemade corn relish. And later, good things to keep you cool during the summer. Stay with us. Whether you're barbecuing in the backyard or picnicking in the park, a perfect addition to any meal is corn relish. Take a look at how to make it. We're gonna make a sweet corn relish that'll remind you of the garden fresh vegetables you had all summer long. This is very easy to prepare and will last for about a month in your refrigerator in an airtight container. And you can use it as a relish, you can use it as a side dish, you can use it on the top of delicious grilled hamburgers or even with a piece of meat. So um, to make eight cups, uh, you need two and a half cups of vinegar. And I'm using cider vinegar because I like the taste of cider vinegar. Um, if you like, you can use Use plain white vinegar, but don't use anything too heavy or too fancy. You don't want to use a red wine vinegar. It's a little too strong. Um, also, one and a quarter cups of sugar. It's kind of important um, to have enough sugar, uh, even though the corn is sweet. Uh, when you're making a sweet relish, sugar and vinegar, very important ingredients. And of course, a really nice melange of spices and salt. Four teaspoons of salt. We're using a sea salt. And we're going to use one and a half teaspoons of mustard seeds, whole mustard seeds. See how pretty they are? So just one and a half teaspoons. Uh, very important in a relish like this. One teaspoon of fresh thyme that's been taken off the stem. We're also going to use uh, half a teaspoon of celery seeds. And uh, for corn, half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. 
So now bring this to a boil. Stir until all that sugar is dissolved. And you're going to cut the kernels off fresh corn. I'm using a very sharp knife that's almost like a Japanese cleaver. Cut just down to the cob without taking any of the cob with the kernels. So I'm using about 10 ears of fresh corn, two red peppers, seeded and very finely minced. And we also have two white onions. You can, of course, add a bay leaf or two. This is how you can change the recipe. And a few black peppercorns, maybe about eight or 10, and maybe one or two allspice berries. Now add your corn. And what we want to do is cook the corn until it turns that beautiful, bright, bright yellow. And we're going to cook the relish for approximately three to five minutes. Oh, look at that, how pretty. You can use orange pepper if you like. You could use, if you want to make it a little bit spicy, you could use a couple jalapeno peppers in here too. So we'll bring that to a boil and cook for three to five minutes. Well, there, I think this is cooked sufficiently. You can see what a brighter color it is. This was butter and sugar corn, so there's white kernels as well as yellow kernels. But uh, it looks ready to jar. So to jar, you can take a scoop, you can take a measuring cup and pour your beautiful relish right down into the jar. Looks good to me. Grandma always made sure all air bubbles left the jar by using a knife like this and just poking down into the jar. See how the bubbles are rising to the top? It's good just to make sure all the air bubbles leave. So now put your tops on. And the secret for getting the ring on tightly is turn and then hold the top. And I put it always on a cloth. So now tighten every ring. And you can use a damp cloth, it really helps. There. Now let them cool. Don't touch for at least an hour or so. Then those can go right into your refrigerator and you can use this, as I said, as a side dish, as a condiment, as a relish, and your family's gonna love it. Here's a clever and lovely way to package your corn relish if you want to bring it to a picnic or give it as a gift. Watch. What do you think about this paper? Corn printed paper. I think it's absolutely beautiful and it's really easy to make. Your kids will love this project. And you can even do this on wrapping paper. What you need are some ears of corn that have nice big kernels. This is a nice mature ear of corn, peeled, every bit of silk removed. Then get yourself a color box pigment stamp pad like this. We've gotten a lot of different colors. We have the golden yellow, we have a pale orange, a bright orange, whatever appeals to you. And then roll the corn quite heavily onto the pad. You wanna coat those kernels really well. And you're gonna have to do this several times to print a whole page of paper. Man, that looks good. And then start, you can start in the center if you like. And roll right over your paper. So there you have one row of corn kernels. Do it again. Very attractive. If you're going to use it as labels for your corn relish jars, as we are going to, you have to cut it into strips and apply a piece like this. Tape this down if you like. Roll your corn right over it. Then remove your label. 
and that will leave you an open spot on which to write. This can then be glued if it's just nicely around the jar. Let it dry though first. And you can write corn relish or whatever you like. You can also add a little label that you can cut out, tie it with a piece of raffia. And it looks really charming. The top of the jar too can be enhanced with a circle. And there you have a gift ready to give to some lucky person. Corn print paper, it's a good thing. So you see, sometimes the simplest ideas are the most clever. We'll be right back. Next, nothing hits the spotlight good old fashioned iced tea Martha's way. And we've got a great tip for keeping it ice cold and undiluted down to the last drop. Later, surefire techniques for grilling seafood so it comes out picture perfect every time. Don't go away. I find iced tea to be a great thirst quencher. And during the summer, um, I like to make all different kinds. The recipe you're about to see is one of my favorites. Take a look. When I'm in East Hampton on the weekends, all during the summer, my friend Marie makes a special blend of iced tea that everyone loves. And they always ask for the recipe, as well as for a second glass. And here's Marie's recipe. Take every kind of tea, the herbal teas, that you have in your closet, in your pantry. They can be chamomile, lemon, black currant, red zinger, hibiscus, rosehip, mint, don't forget mint, really important. And you can add one or two real tea bags like English breakfast or Darjeeling tea, but don't ever add a smoky tea like Lapsang Souchong. It's too strong and kind of takes away from all the delicate herbal flavorings of all those other teas. Use about nine or 10 different kinds of tea and what Marie likes to do is just put all of the bags right into an eight cup Pyrex measure like this. Or if you have a giant teapot, you can put it in the giant teapot and add your boiling water, just boiling water to this. Now, if you have a lot of loose tea bags without any strings, you could just put all those teas into a square of cheesecloth, tie it up, and pour the hot water over the cheesecloth. We have that in this Pyrex pitcher right over to the side. Now just cover them, it smells so good already, and just let it sit for 10 minutes. It can sit longer than 10 minutes, but it has to sit at least 10 minutes. This one has been steeping for quite a while, and I will remove all the tea bags. And now, to this fragrant mix of tea, and it is indeed extremely fragrant. You can add sugar. Oh, start with a quarter of a cup of sugar and the juice of one or two lemons to your taste. And make sure that you don't have any pits in your iced tea. Just use your reamer and squeeze the juice right into a strainer. And now stir. And don't forget a few lemon slices. Very pitty lemon. Depending on the time of the year when you're getting your lemons and the variety of lemons that are at the store, you're gonna get fewer or more pits. Now you can, instead of diluting the iced tea in your pitcher, add the ice to the glasses. That's what Marie does and transfer into a decorative pitcher. And now when you're ready to serve, fill a glass with ice. Add your delicious fragrant tea. And top off with a sprig of fresh mint. And wait till you taste it. It's very refreshing and it's a good thing. Thanks, Marie. One of our viewers' favorite summertime good things first aired in 1995, flavored ice cubes. Watch this. 
You know, when you're sitting out in the sun and you put down your iced coffee, you come back and there's a layer of water from the ice cubes. Well, it's a very easy solution to this problem. Just freeze in ordinary ice cube trays in your freezer, whatever you want to drink. That way, you just freeze it up and put it right in the drinks. Iced coffee tastes so much better when you use ice cubes of coffee. Put three or four in a glass, a little bit of milk, and some fresh cold coffee. No chance of dilution there. The same thing with your iced tea. Same thing with lemonade. I love lemonade frozen like this. And you know what? Some of these flavors go really well with each other, like lemonade ice cubes and my cranberry and red zinger iced tea with a little piece of mint and a squeeze of fresh lime. Makes an awfully good drink. It's a good thing. I think you can see why after all these years, it's still a viewer favorite. We'll be right back. Next, learn loads of barbecuing tips and techniques from grilling expert Chris Lessinger. And later, grilled corn discs, the perfect hors d'oeuvre for your next barbecue. Don't go away. For a successful barbecue, you need to know the basics of grilling. So I invited master barbecue chef Chris Schlesinger to share his expertise. Take a look. Chris is the author of several books and one of the most popular, The Thrill of the Grill. I just uh, love the title and I love the subject and I would really like to know from your viewpoint as an author and a chef, how you go about grilling. Well, I think one of the nice things about grilling is that it's really simple and you don't have a whole lot of choices to make. As far as the grills are concerned, I think the most important thing is having a large enough grill surface. What I like to do is have a grill so that you can have a really hot fire on one part of the grill and then not so hot fire on the other part of the grill so you can move it around. So is this kind of kettle grill large enough for, a, say, a family of four? I believe so, yeah. yes. Okay, so most of us have this kind of grill, I think. No, I think they're very versatile. Okay. The second thing is the fuel that you use. This is hardwood charcoal. Is that your favorite? I think so. I, I like it better because it's a pure product. This is wood that's burned in the absence of oxygen. I think its advantages over briquettes are that it starts easier, it burns hotter, and because it's a pure product, you can add it to the fire once the fire's going. Right, there's no chemical uh, right. release. With the briquettes, you have to wait until the briquettes are totally caught. With this, you can add so you can yeah. have long sessions. It's a very nice, and it's a very hot fire. Right, that's the key to grilling, right. it's a hot fire. Next comes lighting it. There are a couple different ways to light it. There's the electric starter fluid, which is uh, not too friendly to the environment. The easiest, most efficient is this uh, chimney type yeah. setup. So what we do with this, if you crinkle up one piece of paper and, okay. and stick it underneath, one or two pieces just to get the fuel going, and then we put the charcoal in. And just because this is so large, it doesn't mean you put all the charcoal in that you're going to need. So what I usually do is put in enough to get it going, and then I do my grill. I don't skimp on charcoal. So what we would do now with this is we would light it. And in about 15 minutes, it's pretty much all lit. When lighting a fire, people sometimes don't realize this, is all you need is one little bit of white. Really so this is pretty well going. This has probably been on 20 minutes. But if we just had one of those coals and I put it into the charcoal, it would eventually light the whole thing. So grilling really has been around for thousands of years, I would think, don't you? Don't you? I well, mean, humans' most original way of cooking, and I think that it's still, that it has that draw, that kind of prehistoric. And grilling is like a quick way to cook, not like barbecuing, which is a slow way to cook. Right. Grilling, to me, is a very fast, very hot process, so it, certain things are appropriate for it and other things are not. Any other tools that we need specifically for grilling that everybody should well, not again, be without? Well, again, I come from the school that, that simple is better. Yeah. And so what I recommend is tongs. We use these in the restaurant business and they're spring loaded. Right. And this allows you when you are working with a hot fire to be able to stay off the fire and to quickly move things. And I, I think these are great and it's worth making the trip to the restaurant supply store. The other thing, having the nice clean grill marks and food not sticking and just tasting good. We use the uh, all important brush. 
The grill itself is really clean. Right, and I'll leave this on while we're starting the fire. I let the okay. grill get really hot and that'll burn the debris off and then I give it a couple swipes and then again right before I'm getting ready to cook. Well, it looks like the fire is getting there already. Well, this hardwood charcoal, that's one of the main advantages is it's quick lighting. Once you dump the chimney into the coals, Usually it'll allow about 30 or 40 minutes before you start cooking. So time backwards from your meal. Right, and you can tell when the fire is ready to go because it has a uniform gray ash. So over it's the that top. gray that you want. Well, that's a nice hot fire, so we go with our meat here and then perhaps bring it off to the sides to let it finish cooking. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Grilling is definitely an art, and it's always good to learn from a pro. Next, Chris shares great recipes and simple techniques for barbecuing salmon, tuna, and swordfish. If you're looking for a healthy and delicious alternative to steak and burgers on the grill, why don't you try seafood? You'll become proficient in no time with grilling expert Chris Schlesinger's recipes and techniques. They're all on our website at MarthaStewart.com, but watch this. Well, the grill is ready. Chris has just moved around the charcoal a little bit just to spread it out so we have enough room, right? Right. And Chris is gonna show us his way of cooking fish steaks. We've got swordfish, delicious looking tuna, and some beautiful salmon steaks. You like the steak rather than the filet. You think it holds together better? Well, I think there are a lot of different fish that are appropriate for the grill, but for people who are just starting to cook fish on the grill, I definitely recommend going with a steak because it's sturdier and it'll hold up a little bit. And these are all about an inch thick. Is that your favorite thickness? I like them thick because it allows you to get a nice sear crust on the outside before they're completely cooked inside. Also, you have interesting marinades, which are not really marinades, really sort of rubs. Right, what I like to do as opposed to marinating is make a, either a dry rub or a paste and rub it on the outside. And what I think this does is help creates a nice crusty outside while letting the inside of the fish taste like the fish. Right. So the first one we'll do is a wet paste or herb paste. And what this is is a, a half cup of mixed chopped herbs, kind of Mediterranean style. What, like oregano and parsley? Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, basil. So we put that in. This is a quarter cup of olive oil. We have two big tea chopped garlic. Okay. And uh, this is red chili flake. Half a tablespoon. Half a big tea. Big tea is? A tablespoon. Little tea is a uh, teaspoon. Okay. Mix this up. And this can be done like this. I like kind of like this because it's nice and fresh. Or you can also put all these ingredients together in the food processor and make even more of a paste. Well, I like it like this. A right. Bit coarse. And then what about the lemon juice? Thank you. Quarter of a cup of lemon juice. So this is basically the same ingredients that would go in a marinade, but um, I think they retain their individual flavors more. But if you're going to cook three different kinds of fish, wouldn't it be nice to have three different flavors? Well, that's what I, I think we yeah. should do. So okay. the, the next one would be a simple dry rub, which is, uh, you see this a lot in Texas when they do barbecue with the brisket is putting a mixture of spices on the outside. So a quarter of a cup of? A quarter cup of paprika. A quarter of a cup of, uh, these are toasted crushed coriander seed. Mm. A quarter cup of uh, toasted ground cumin seed. So you toast them in a pan over the flame? Yeah, just to bring out the essential oils, they get a little smoky and makes your house smell great. A quarter cup of brown sugar, which is something you don't see in a lot of spice mixtures, but is more like a southwestern so Texas thing. So even on fish, you're gonna put sugar. Right, and this is a little salt and pepper. When uh, people think about grilling fish, one of their uh, fears is kind of the fish sticking to the grill. But if you follow my three tips for not sticking fish to the grill. Chris's golden rules. That's right, okay. for the first time in public. The first thing is to have your grill very hot and very clean. And again, we all important brush. And we've had this grill over the surface while the uh, fire's been catching, so it's very hot. The second is to lightly oil the fish. Why don't we do the tuna plain? Okay. You don't want to put too much on because the excess will drop down into the fire. So you've just put a little bit of salt and freshly ground pepper? That's right. And then the third is once you put it on the grill to allow it to sit there and don't fool with it right away. 
I think the uh, this little sweet barbecue rub, slightly sweet barbecue rub, would be nice with the salmon. This one's not super hot, so you can go a little heavy with it and rub it in. And the mm -hmm. idea here is to just get a nice, even coating on the outside. And you don't really need to oil this because the, the dry herbs kind of help create that surface difference. So we put so that down. So now this only has two, two golden rules. Well, with, the, with dry <laughs> rub, it goes to two. It's a little complex, right? So we put that down. And now the swordfish, which is a beautiful fish. And that's a nice, thick that, yeah, piece of swordfish. Great. And uh, we'll do the, uh, the wet herb paste on that. And this is nice. You can get the sides on a nice, thick cut like this. Mm. I think we're going to let the swordfish go for a second. Right. So we're getting ready to flip the tuna. And tongs? Well, I kind of prefer the tongs on this. Sometimes with the spatulas, uh, you dig an edge. But with these, I would try to work on the edges. And then to try to get those marks, we go back at a 90-degree uh, angle. So we can't angle. see it yet. But just turn it on a 90-degree angle. Right, that so way you're going to get a crisscross. Okay. Right, that's what we're looking for. I like to go and make sure the one side has a nice sear on it. So I won't really flip it until I get the nice sear. We can look at the salmon now. That's mm, got a beautiful. beautiful crusty outside. Fish is one of the easiest uh, foods to tell if it's done because you can just kind of look inside on it. Fish cooked through will have a totally opaque appearance. And any bit of translucency that, indicates underdoneness. But here on this tuna, you're just getting a little sense. Tiny little bit of pink. Yeah. So I would say that's done. And some people even like to eat their tuna very rare. See, the swordfish is nice and thick, which I like because it allows the fish to stay on a little bit more and we'll be able to get a nicer sear. So let's just look at this guy. See, we got to work him kind of carefully. Yeah, you don't want to tear him. Well, no, these things are, you know, delicate. very delicate, right? And let me see if I can, so. so oh, it's here, perfect. So we oh, have I just a little that. bit of translucency in the middle. Tiny, mm, I'm going to eat this one. OK. <laughs> and then we'll flip our sword. Would you like to go ahead and make the quick sauce for oh, yeah, this one? Would, this is a mango sauce, a vinaigrette. One cup of mango. This is pureed mango mm. with a quarter cup of fresh lime mm. juice. This is a dish that goes to show you that good food doesn't have to be real difficult and that's to make. That jalapeno? is jalapeno. Two tea of chopped jalapeno, and that's a quarter cup of fresh cilantro. Now, which fish are you going to use this sauce on? Well, I think it'd go with any of them, but I think I'd like it particularly with the salmon because it has that kind of nice crusty little spicy outside and uh, this would contrast and complement that. Next, a deliciously sweet good thing for your next barbecue, grilled corn discs. We'll be right back. If you're hosting a barbecue, here is a good thing your guests are going to love as an appetizer. And while you're grilling, you can just pass a bowl of beautiful blackened corn discs. They're grilled. Uh, just pass them around. Let people munch on those while they watch the steaks and the burgers and the fish grilling on the grill. Uh, they're easy to make, too. Um, if you find some really pretty bicolored corn or um, silver queen or silver king or um, just cut it into, clean it all up, take off the husks and all the silk, and then with a serrated knife, we've been uh, experimenting how to get the discs cut correctly. If you just turn it like that and then press down with your serrated knife, you can get these discs. Uh, do this ahead of time, a um, couple hours at the most, because you don't want to uh, see how nicely they break up. And these are just so nice to pick up and munch on. It's much easier than a great big ear of corn, but the recipe is good for an ear of corn too. Um, so once you have your discs, you just brush them with some olive oil, sprinkle them with salt and pepper. And I like to use lime and cayenne pepper too. You can sprinkle them with that. Um, you can uh, make a little mixture. You can even uh, throw these all in a big bowl and toss them with uh, some flavorings and just put them in a very, very hot um, grill pan or right out on your charcoal grill. And these can just be put right in the pan. You, I grill them all the way around on the cut sides first and then on the round side, on the kernels, and let them cook until they get those nice black marks. Sprinkle with salt and pepper. And a little bit of that 
extra delicious cayenne. And once you take them out, and then I just sprinkle with a little bit of fresh lime juice, and it's tasty. Grilled corn discs are a summertime good thing. For more information on today's show, visit MarthaStewart.com, our website. Tune in tomorrow for a show filled with lots of simple summer projects that you and your family are going to love, plus great meal ideas, and of course, more of our favorite good things. See you then.